Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Jan McLeod from PCR, and I'd like to welcome you to this session where we delve into the topic of artificial intelligence and its impact on interventional cardiology. Today, we are privileged to have three AI experts joining us. Firstly, I'd like to welcome Dr. Niels van Royen, Professor and Head of Cardiology from the Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands, and his colleague, who's also from the same center, Dr. Bram van Ginneken, Professor of Medical Image Analysis, and they are joined by Richard Raposa, DVP of Global Research and Development from Abbott Vascular. So let's start by breaking down the fundamentals. Dr. Van Ginneken, could you enlighten us on what exactly is AI and clarify any distinctions between AI and machine learning? For example, are there varying levels of AI that we should be aware of? Yes, that's a good question because nowadays everybody calls everything AI because it's a bit of a hype. Uh, AI is, of course, an old field with all kinds of techniques. And machine learning is one of the techniques in AI. And in machine learning, we are trying to learn from examples. So in cardiology, you would take frames from an OCT um, and you could label them as suspect or normal. And if you have a lot of examples, you can learn from that. And then within machine learning, there's a particular subset of techniques called deep learning, where you work with very large neural networks. And basically, deep learning has been the big breakthrough of artificial intelligence. All the results that uh, just work very well are based on deep learning these days. So thank you, Dr. Van Ginneken. Now I'm going to pass over to Dr. Van Royen, and I'm going to ask about the impact of AI on interventional cardiology. It would be great if you could share some real world examples with us. Yes, well, I think the, the real impact uh, we're still about to face. Um, interventional cardiologists always have been uh, early adapters. Uh, I think this is certainly the case, will be the case also for artificial intelligence. Uh, I think uh, we have to face the fact that we have a, a limited brain capacity, and that's not only for interventional cardiologists, but uh, more uh, mankind uh, in general. Uh, the, the difference for interventional cardiologists is that we have to take these uh, ad hoc decisions all the time. So we have these enormous uh, amounts of uh, information uh, just uh, uh, brought to us uh, in the cat lab. So it's uh, all kind of hemodynamics, it's visuals, it's the angiogram, it's the patient itself. And then based on all this information this, that, is, that is growing uh, every year, you have to make these ad hoc accurate decisions. So that's where I think uh, uh, it can really help us. It, there is already some good examples for artifact detection, for example, uh, pressure and flow curves. Uh, there is uh, some good examples on uh, warning systems for, for uh, potentially um, uh, complex interventions, for, for example, high calcium load. Uh, but as said, I think uh, the, the real impact uh, is, uh, is still to come. So now I'm going to move on to Richard and ask the question about how is Abbott embracing AI? Richard. We are uh, taking a, sim a simple approach to it in the sense that uh, we want to automate the tasks that are complex in nature, but uh, simplify the procedure. For example, uh, we found that during the Illumium 4 trial, training participants in the trial and identifying the external elastic lamina takes a while. And on top of that, if you have to manually make measurements, the measurements will never be the same from patient to patient to patient, accuracy is lost. So automating that using AI is ideal because it, you don't waste any time trying to find that lamina. You don't have to waste time clicking away to find the diameter. You just get the diameter on the screen when there's enough lamina available for a measurement to be made. So simplifying that kind of thing is important because procedures need to move fast. There's a lot of patient, the patient load on physicians is high. And I almost want to say we empathize with them by selecting things that make their life simpler. That was great, Richard. So now I'm going to pass over to Dr. Van Ginneken again and Dr. Van Royen, where I'm going to ask about what the challenges of AI. If we go to Dr. Van Ginneken first. Yeah, I think a main challenge we have when we develop AI algorithm is algorithms is acquiring data. 
So the best results are obtained if you have both input and output mapped. So if we want to recognize structures, we have all the frames in an OCT uh, sweep and we need to manually label where the, uh, the structures are, where the suspicious signs are. So these days, more and more of our time is spent on collecting data and collecting annotations. And training of the algorithms is uh, also a developing field, but there are now standard techniques that actually work uh, quite well. Thank you. So now could we um, pose the same question to you, Dr. Van Royen? No, I, I, I totally agree. And that is really uh, a, a, a difficult task. Uh, we have been working together on uh, the use of AI for detection of high-risk plaques uh, from OCT scans. But the amount of work uh, needed there to make all these manual annotations uh, is, is huge. And of course, time uh, is on our side in this respect because there's more and more labs working on uh, on these kind of algorithms. So there's more and more um, uh, well annotated uh, um, uh, scans available, but it's true. It all starts with very high quality um, scans uh, that have been interpreted by experts. Uh, without that basis, uh, you will never develop an accurate uh, algorithm. So Richard, now tell me about some of the challenges um, that Abbott have had and how you've overcome these challenges. I couldn't agree more with the statements that were made. It is a difficult task. It is tedious. It requires a lot of data. Our main uh, problem we've encountered is having the data availability to us and uh, then uh, surviving the quality controls that need to be placed on that data. So we typically lose about 40% of the data because it's just not processable. So good quality data is ideal, but more importantly, getting connectivity on all equipment so that we can start collaborating worldwide to make a data lake of data so that we all can benefit from that data. It'll be available, it could be curated, it could be cleaned up, and then we can all use it to develop these algorithms. That's important for us to be able to create that community in, uh, of data in a data lake to be able to simplify the task a little bit more, at least have that necessary data to make quality algorithms out of them. That was great, thank you. So if we move on to the last question now, um, it's about how we combine the growing extensive use of artificial intelligence and, and what are the roles and responsibilities of the physician? So Dr. Van Royen, if you'd like to close with this last question, that would be great. Very important question again. Um, of course, there's so, so the the possibilities are huge. At the same time, we have to realize that not everybody is uh, so enthusiastic about AI as uh, as we might be as researchers, as physicians, um, but there's the world outside and uh, there's also a lot of concerns. Uh, and some of them I think are, uh, are, are true concerns. Uh, we have to deal of course with the um, uh, privacy um, protection, uh, we have to deal with the fact that it sometimes feels a little bit like a black box. So like the machine is taking uh, the uh, the decisions uh, for us. So I think it is very important. That is our main responsibility to verify that what we're doing uh, is actually of added value. So for that, we need clinical trials so we can develop all these beautiful algorithms. But we have to test them in real world clinical trials to show that they're uh, actually working and that they are of benefit uh, for the patient. And then if we have convinced ourselves that this is um, a technique that is going to help us uh, uh, further, then we have to also explain our patients and uh, also the uh, the institutions um, uh, that uh, this technique is actually of benefit and I, I think there we have a very important role. So thank you very much for your time today and for your insight. Um, we uh, look very much look forward to your PCR 2024. Thank you. Mm -hmm.